I'm Huey Toonmore. Welcome to Season 7 of Huey's Animated Movie Reviews, the show where I review animated films from old or recent, whether they be hand-drawn, stop-motion, or computer-generated. On March 3, 1933, one of the most influential and groundbreaking movies was released upon the world and had since become our most loved icon for many years to come. That movie was King Kong. Directed by Marion C. Cooper and Ernest B. Schotzak, and with stop-motion effects by the legendary Willis O'Brien, King Kong told the story of a film crew led by wildlife filmmaker Carl Denham, who traveled to a mysterious island where they encounter a giant gorilla worshipped as a god by the local natives, who takes a romantic interest in their leading lady, Anne Darrow. After encountering the many perils of the island, such as non-extinct dinosaurs, giant lizards, and pterosaurs, Kong is then captured and taken to New York City, where he escapes, runs amok, and of course, climbs the Empire State Building carrying Anne in his grasp, is shot down by biplanes, and falls to his tragic death. Oh no, it wasn't the airplanes. Was beauty kill the beast? To this day, the film's legacy has inspired many big names in the film industry, from Ray Harryhausen to Peter Jackson, and has spawned many spin-offs such as King Kong vs. Godzilla and King Kong Escapes by Toho, and remake adaptations such as Dino De Laurentiis' remake in 1976, its awful sequel King Kong Lives in 1986, and the recent Peter Jackson remake in 2005. But little do people know or remember that there was actually a third remake way back in 1998, which happened to be a animated musical. Now, King Kong is no stranger to hand-drawn animation. In 1966, he starred in The King Kong Show, produced by Rankin Bass, and Kong the Animated Series in 2001. However, the movie I have to review today makes those series seem like masterpieces in comparison. Never have I seen a remake so rushed, so poorly animated, and so insulting to the original source material, I wonder why it was even made in the first place. Well, may as well start the review. Released to video and DVD on June 16th, 1998, the movie is The Mighty Kong. First off, I bet you're all wondering why the movie is called The Mighty Kong instead of King Kong. Well, during that same year, Disney released its own remake of another famous giant gorilla movie, Mighty Joe Young. So basically, the Lana Film Company, the people behind this film, were just trying to cash in on Disney's attempt, much like other direct-to-video movies those days, or even what Video Bring Cueto does with Pixar and DreamWorks films these days. Great. One more reason for me to hate this movie. So the film begins with... Skull Island? What, already? Are you serious? It's better to wait for the build-up to do that, not at the very beginning. And get this, the title only appeared 20 seconds since the start of the movie. And they show Kong 2? Thanks for spoiling the impact already, movie! You jerk. We then cut to the Hoboken docks in New York circa 1933 as we see sailors loading supplies onto a steamship including explosives. Well, I'll give this movie credit, it does at least take place in the same time period as the original, unlike the 70s remake. Here we meet our hero, Jack Driscoll, who kinda looks like Sylvester Stallone for some reason. I don't know, the hair and lips are a dead giveaway. Along with Captain Englehorn, who looks like Bibbo from Superman the Animated Series. The men don't sound very happy, Captain. Uh, and I don't blame them one bit. But the owner says the cargo is legal. And business is business. Makes you wonder, what kind of a business operates this way? A movie company. What else? I remember one time I was working with that Uwe Wall chap. I guess you worked on Dungeon Siege? Nah, Postal. Very poor taste. 
though it was very similar to the games. We then moved to Broadway, where an animal-themed musical produced by filmmaker Carl Denham, here called C.B. Denham, what's the B stand for anyway, is finishing up its final performance. And judging by the production design of this musical, you can see why this is its final performance. Men in bad animal costumes, tap dancing, women in skimpy, lazily designed outfits, playing with puppets, and let's not forget the awful songwriting. And this was, of course, made during a time where all straight-to-video animated features were required by law to have at least five or six musical numbers in them, whether the source material they were based on had them or not. Jeez, who did these guys get to write the songs for this piece of... What? What? They got the Sherman Brothers to write the songs? The Sherman Brothers? The same team who wrote the songs for such beloved films as The Sword in the Stone, Mary Poppins, Chi Chi Bang Bang, The Jungle Book, Winnie the Pooh, Bit Ups and Broomsticks, Sumi Come Home, Charlotte's Web, and Little Nemo in Slumberland, those Sharon Brothers? Oh well, at least there's only one bad song for them in this movie so far. I'm sure the rest are going to be pretty damn good. <laughs> hell was that? And if you thought Jack Black playing Carl Denham in the Peter Jackson remake was a huge miscast, take a listen as to who they got to play him here. I'm telling you, Roscoe, closing this show is the smartest thing I've ever done. Now we move on to bigger and better adventures. That's right, Dudley Moore. Okay? Now don't get me wrong, I have nothing against Dudley Moore. I think he was one of the greatest comical actors who ever lived, and I'm very sad that he is no longer with us. But every time Denim opens his mouth in this movie, all I hear is spin from really wild animals. And if any of you out there know what I'm talking about, then you have my utmost respect. For those of you who don't, I'll talk about it some other time. Anyway, Denim reveals to the press that he'll be going on a secret wildlife safari to shoot a new movie. The question is, will there be romance, and who's the star? Star? With my impeccable taste, I might find her right here, in the jungles of Manhattan. But since the people behind this movie think kids will think a talent search for the perfect girl will be boring, Denim finds his star across the street being accosted for stealing an apple from a stand. This is our heroine, Anne Darrow, voiced by Ariel herself, Jodie Benson. Ah, oh, come on. It's only an apple. Only an apple? You think these things grow on trees? So like in the original movie, Denim helps out Anne by paying for the apple, then takes her to a restaurant and asks her to star in his new project. It's a passionate romance. A daring adventure. A searing drama of... Um... Um, a, a, a poignancy. Yes, poignancy, pathos, and uh, love in the South Pacific. Ooh, I feel a song coming on. Oh, what a luscious life you'll lead in Lotus Land. In Hollywood. <laughs> Living it up in the movie colony. Beverly Hills. Ah. Once you are a movie star, your life is really lush. Lush. When you're rolling in the money, even rainy days are suddenly hmm. telling your beauty secrets. No, it's... You're not that bad. I like it. It's catchy, has a nice beat to it, and it definitely fits with the style the Sherman Brothers are accustomed to. And Dudley Moore's singing voice is an absolute delight to hear. It's got laughter, it's got tears, mystery, and fear. It's majestic, but it's intimate as well. <laughs> it's got drama, it's got heart, it's got terror, but it's art. And climactically, it casts a mystic spell. Mystic spell! But the problem is that it's a film about King Kong. It's just too out of place and too stupid to compete with Disney. And sadly, there are more songs coming up. So after the song is done, Denim asks Anne to sign a contract, and she gladly accepts. Hmm. A character played by Jody Benson is convinced to sign a contract after song and dance number. I am getting the weirdest Little Mermaid vibes right now. 
Well, anyway, Anne goes to the docks and encounters these two. Oh, God, these two. These are Chips and Ricky, the so-called comic reliefs of the movie. And when I say comic reliefs, I mean bumbling, incompetent sidekicks put in so children can have someone to relate to and laugh at while their parents just find them goddamn irritating. He's Chips. I'm Ricky. Able-bodied cabin boy, SS Java Queen. <laughs> whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. What did he say? Able-bodied cabin boy, SS Java Queen. Java Queen? Java Queen? In the original film and the 2005 remake, the ship was called the SS Venture. What the hell kind of name is Java Queen? Sounds like the name of a coffee brand or something. Just when I give this film a little bit of credit, it finds totally new ways to piss me off. One of them being the animation. It varies from good to bad. It's like a mix between 80 Saturday morning cartoons to 90 straight to video standards. It's very irritating. What's worse is the editing. I mean, take a look at this next scene. Hey, watch it, mate! Ah! Lady, I said clear the deck! Get out of there before you get... What the... Hey! Relay the hoist! Relay the hoist! It takes too long for that load of crates to drop. The timing is so horrible. Also... And is a friggin' klutz! Reminds me of something Jack said in the original movie. I guess you don't think much of women on ships, do you? No, they're a nuisance. Well, I'll try not to be. You've been on the way already. In this movie, however, Anne is more than just a nuisance. She's a walking disaster area! Go to your cabin and stay there. And you, get that monkey out of my sight before I have him keel hauled. Do you believe the way he treated me? I didn't do anything to deserve that. Not one thing, not one thing at all. Yes, you did, you annoying bimbo! Oh, where's Faye, Ray, or Naomi Watts when you need them? The next day, the Java Queen sails out of port and journeys out into the open ocean. However, some of the sailors on board are curious as to where they are headed. On his last ship, he shoved off from Hobart and pushed west across the Great Australian Bank. By the time we reach the Indian Ocean, we're dead in the water. Suddenly we're in the middle of the thickest, filthiest fog I've ever seen in my whole life. Then, we see this spooky looking island, poking through the mist. Look just like a skull. Captain decides to put a couple of longboats ashore to get help. So, 30 of my shipmates push off. And then, nothing. The captain hangs around another day or so. Finally gets the engines cranked up and pushes off north to Darwin. Just as we weighed anchor, we spied a poor soul struggling through the surf. We dragged him on board. He raved and ranted about a giant monkey god. About human sacrifices and all that jazz. Then, the poor guy just up and died on us. Dead as a mackerel. I have mixed feelings about this scene. I mean, yeah, it still gives away what Kong is and what the natives do on the island, but there is some good exposition and the way it's presented isn't bad either. Oh no, I just complimented the movie again. That means something's gonna happen to piss me off, doesn't it? Oh, you look terrible. Oh, I'll look a lot worse if the captain doesn't get his grub. But, oh, right now I'm not feeling so good. Thought so. It's not her fault she's a woman. She probably doesn't even know she's a jinx. A jinx? <sighs> oh, oh, why you arrogant oaf! I'll show you jinx! Uh. Uh. Oh hey, look, he's a chowderhead! <laughs> God, this movie sucks. The next morning, Denim has Anne do some screen tests, much like in the original film, only in this version it's accompanied by a Tropical Island song. A song with one hell of a tongue twister for a name. She's sweet, dolly up a polly ollie. 
sweet, sweet dolly of Papali Ali. She's the dolly, the dolly of Papali, the dolly of Papali Ali. Gosh, oh golly, they all go off the trolley because they love my Polly Ali smile. My God, is this song bad? Also, what the frick frag am I watching? I mean, with the dancing lobsters, Patrick the Starfish and his twin brother playing ukuleles, the kissing seals in live-action water, the tortoise band... What the hell is all this doing in a King Kong movie?! It's like they're trying to be Disney without ever having seen a Disney movie before. So, if you've seen the original movie, you know the usual spiel. Then it reveals to the Captain and Jack where they're headed. They're hesitant about it. He shows them a map of it. Oh, wait! Wait a minute! Hold on! That's not a map! That's just a drawing a kindergartner did! And since when did Skull Island have a friggin' volcano on it?! But that's why this map cost me a thousand dollars. Not. Worth. A. Penny. And this voyage is about something special. What we're looking for is a mystical island. It's a land that time forgot. Well, you're certainly no Doug McClure, that's for sure. I guess you haven't a clue that you're the lucky crew, not only of this ship, but of the greatest movie production of them all! So what? Oh, for I'm about to make a truly epic film that's greater than any film you can recall! Big deal. Well, there goes the only song I actually liked in the movie. Jeez, how much longer do we have to spend on this friggin' boat before we get to the island already? Land ho! That's it! It's got to be... Skull Island! Ugh! Finally! Only took about 28 minutes. Not as long as it took in the Peter Jackson remake, but it certainly felt longer! So everyone sets out into the jungles of Skull Island and eventually come across the native crew performing a sacrificial ceremony. Unfortunately, Dem's clumsy assistant Roscoe accidentally gives away their position and the natives quickly surround them. The natives then notice Anne among the sailors and try to bargain for her. The sailors, of course, say no, shoot at the natives, and run like hell back to the ship. I don't even know why I'm even explaining this. I'm sure all of you have seen the original King Kong and probably know what's gonna happen. Oh, who am I kidding? After what I've seen so far, who knows what the hell they're gonna do next to spit on the original movie. And here's another problem with the film. How quickly Anne and Driscoll have settled their issues with each other and fell in love. And even have a romantic song together. I'm gabbing too much and saying nothing. Why can't I clam up? I've never been this way. This isn't like me. I'm never silent. Completely tongue-tied, without a word to say. Okay, this is definitely trying too hard to be like a Disney film. I mean, damn, is this song cliched or what? It doesn't sound like anything the Sherman Brothers would ever write. It sounds too much like the romantic songs we know from the Disney Renaissance, except, you know, crap. Jody Benson may be a pretty damn good singer, but even she isn't enough to save this turkey of a song. Afterwards, Niv sneak aboard the ship, kidnap Anne while accidentally leaving behind one of their bracelets, which this annoying turd discovers and reports to Jack, Denim, and the Captain. They get on the lifeboats and make their way to the island to rescue Anne from the sacrificial ceremony. And of course, after 42 minutes of waiting, Kong finally makes his anticipated appearance. Or Mighty Peking Man. Jeez, there are so many things wrong with this setup. One, what happened to the wall and the stone altar? We clearly saw them at the beginning of the movie and when the sailors first appeared on the island, so what's with the makeshift altar on wheels and why is it set on fire? Two, why does Kong come out of a friggin' volcano when in the beginning he appeared out from behind the trees like in the original film? And three, what is up with Kong's design? He looks almost as bad as the Kong costume used for King Kong vs. Godzilla! Was it the filmmaker's intent to make Kong look like a guy in a gorilla costume instead of, oh, I don't know, a gorilla? So anyway, as Kong makes off with Anne, Jack discovers a tunnel in the side of the volcano and volunteers to go and get Anne back. The others volunteer as well, load their weapons, and follow Jack in, ready to face certain death in order to get back. Or Kong blocks the entrance with some boulders, and Denim and the others run away and scream like little girls. Well, 
There goes a chance of seeing an animated reenactment of the famous log scene. And since when was Denham such a spineless coward? In the original film, Carl Denham was not only a filmmaker, but also a tough-as-nails big game hunter who'd put himself in the midst of certain death if it meant to get the scene just right. This is mainly because of both Robert Armstrong's superb acting ability and the fact that the character was based off Marion C. Cooper himself. Do you always take the pictures yourself? Ever since the trip I made to Africa, I don't got a swell picture of a charging rhino, but the cameraman got scared. A darn fool, I was right there with a rifle. Seems he didn't trust me to get the rhino before it got him. I'm a fool with cameraman sense to do it myself. But the animated denim is such a little weenie, he even makes Jack Black's denim look good. Oh yeah, it's that bad. Meanwhile, Jack continues to follow Kong and Anne, but a T-Rex comes in and fights him. And not even the dinosaurs can save this movie. Seriously, it's a 10 second fight with the T-Rex. But the original film and Jackson's remake were much longer and more intense. Plus, in both films, Kong ripped its friggin' jaws apart! But this it is a kid's film, so I can understand why they kept out that part. But still, the fight could have at least lasted a few minutes longer. And don't give me the excuse that kids wouldn't pay attention. Remember the land before time? Not only are we getting a rushed action sequence, but we also have a rushed character development scene with Kong and Anne. And again, the other two films did it better. That includes this scene, which was ripped straight from the 76 remake. Oh hey, Jack's come to the rescue! Wow, that was fast. So Jack manages to rescue Anne, and just in time too, as the area's about to collapse during a volcano eruption. Wait, what? Okay, this is pretty much overkill. Like, we don't have enough rushed action in this movie already. Jeez, maybe Denim was right. Maybe this is the land that time forgot. Either that or the same rushed ending from Son of Kong. Anyway, the annoying kid and his equally annoying monkey sidekick come in to get Denim and Roscoe out of the jungle, but Denim decides to stay put. This is between me and Kong. Captain Ahab and Moby Dick. It is our destiny. Says the guy who ran away screaming when Kong tried to bury him under boulders. Meanwhile, Kong continues his pursuit of Jack and Anne to the jungle, who head for the beach where the captain and the rest of the crew are waiting for them. But, Mr. Denham... Uh, you know where he is? Uh, yeah, I'll show you. No, Ricky, you go to the boat. The monkey will show me the way. Come on, Chips. He don't work without me, Mr. Driscoll. Okay, then I'll just go out, you little prick. Hope Kong kills you. So they find Denham as well as Kong, so Jack throws a gas bomb at him, but it's not entirely effective. The captain throws another gas bomb at him, and he's out like a light. Ah, there it is. The biggest, the fiercest, the, the greatest beast on Earth. And we've got him, Japs. Ha, we've got him! We're millionaires, boys! I'll share it with all of you! Why, in a few months it'll be up in lights on Broadway! Kong! The eighth wonder of the world! We then cut to months later in New York, where Denim is holding an exhibition of Kong on Broadway, where... Oh no, not another song! He's the biggest beast on Earth! And it's a reprise of the first song. Oh, please, God, just shoot me. After that, we then get another song by Anne, which doesn't really help either.
Again, Jody Benson is a great singer, but this, like most of the songs in the film, is completely unnecessary. Especially since the song is set to black and white clips of Kong's fight with the snake from earlier. Anyway, after the song, Anne feels concerned about Kong being chained up during the event, but Denim tries to reassure her. This poor animal is just not meant to be in chains. Of course he's not. None of us are. But don't you see, he's a trooper. <sighs> just like you and me. And it's not as though he's just working for bananas alone. I've got my eye on a thousand acres spread for him in South Jersey. No, oh, he can't survive in Jersey. Nobody can. Normally, I would be pissed off at that kind of remark, but considering the fact that we've had a lot of snow over here, I doubt he'd survive too. But I will leave you with a lovely parting gift. Bitch. Anyway, Denim announces Kong on stage, and of course, things don't go too well with the big ape. Stop! I'm warning you, I say! Yipes! That does it. You'll never work in this town again. Please say Kong squashes him. Please. Nope. Kong decides to break out of the theater and rampages through the city to find Anne. And of course, hijinks ensue. How the hell does that work? It's not like it had the same amount of strength as a fire hose. Huh? Hey, put us down! You're under arrest! How do you arrest a 50-foot gorilla, you morons? Well, that's one way of telling kids not to smoke. Ah! What the hell was that about? Don't get me wrong, in the original film, Kong did kill people during his New York rampage, including chewing on a guy, dropping a woman off a building, and even attacking a train full of people on an elevated track. But this is just so bad, the fact that he would cause a train and car collision, killing the people in the car, and possibly a few on the train, is pretty rough for a crappy kids film. How the hell did that even get past the censors? How do you think kids reacted when that scene happened? Hell, how do you think their parents reacted? So anyway, like in the original film, Kong finds Anne in a hotel room, kidnaps her, and takes her to the top of the Empire State Building. Alright. Alright. So this is it. The most famous scene from the original movie. Kong's climactic biplane fight atop the Empire State Building. A scene that has become an iconic moment in motion picture history. There is no way the filmmakers can screw up such a beloved scene as this. <laughs> You know, bad animation aside, this scene really isn't that bad. It actually looks like they're staying true to the original ending. Maybe I was wrong about the filmic- JESUS! She fell? And fell? Where the hell were you on that, Kong? I thought you had a thing for her! You didn't even try to catch her! There's more than one way to get a gorilla off the Empire State Building. That's him! Oh yeah, because that's what the original King Kong was missing. Blimps carrying a cargo net to try and catch Kong. Jeez, this is like something Fairly Odd Parents or Rugrats would do. Not even the 76 remake did anything this stupid! It's almost over, Huey. It's almost over. You can get through this! So just as one of the blimps is able to catch Kong, he breaks through the net and falls to his demise. Jack rescues Anne, she cries over Kong, and Denim utters the slightly altered famous last words of the original film. You know, chaps, when you write this story, remember, 
It wasn't the fall that killed Kong. It was beauty that killed the beast. And so ends the tragic story of Kong. A beast who could take on anything from dinosaurs to giant snakes, but sadly couldn't survive the most savage jungle of them all, civilization. What? He lives? Kong lives? How can a film this bad stoop to such a low that makes crap like Care Bears and Rainbow Bright look like Princess Mononoke? They take a movie as beloved as King Kong, a movie that's supposed to have a tragic ending, and after having a long fall from the Empire State Building, they went with a happy ending by having him come back to life? You stupid, money-grubbing sons of bitches! Things that bother you never bother me. I feel happy and fine. Ha ha! Living. This movie. This. This movie. This movie is worse than the 1976 remake. It is worse than King Kong Lives. Hell, it's almost worse than Dinotopia Quest for the Ruby Sunstone. Just barely though, just barely. The movie is awful. The animation is unbearable. The characters are either unlikable, annoying, or downright embarrassing. The story is insulting to fans of the original film, and the songs, apart from one, are some of the worst ever. And this is the friggin' Sherman Brothers we're talking about! One of the greatest songwriting teams Ever. The whole process of this film makes the CGI Donkey Kong series look good. Just the idea of them remaking this film into an animated project, if you would even call it a remake, is a huge insult to the people who made the original film. Hell, it's an insult to the people who made the 1976 remake. My rating? One star! Because anything higher would be too generous for a film this atrocious! So the next time you want to introduce your kids to the glory that is King Kong, show them the original film. Not this poorly animated, poorly written, poorly executed tripe that is even worthy of the name Kong. More worthy of the name Mighty Gorg, if you ask me. Well, that's all for now. Be sure to join me for my next review. Till then, I think I'm going to reacquaint myself with an old friend. See you at the movies. Animated movies, that is.